It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, of course, Douglas Coleman. How are you? We got two guests today. First one up is Bill Obrist Jr., who is a returning guest. He was uh, on about three years ago promoting a film, and he's back now promoting another film. This one is called Great Land, and it's bizarre to say the least, but check out the trailer and see what you think. We have a conversation about uh, interpreting the trailer and what is this film really all about. Uh, sounds wacky. Sounds pretty interesting. He will be followed by Frederick Keeve. Frederick is a composer, a director, an actor. His new film out is called The Accompanist, and it premiered on June 2nd from Dark Star Pictures. And it's about an accompanist, piano player, who falls in love with a ballet dancer. And it's a good film, and the music is brilliant. The music is very powerful. So check it out. It's available on all the usual places, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and wherever else streaming video is offered. So it seems like life is slowly getting back to normal. After the virus, Uh, some places are opening up. I know in Vegas, the casinos are open, except for the buffets, which I'm kind of glad because that's a little too touchy-feely of the food, and uh, I think better they keep those closed for a little while. So, anyways, we will be right back with Bill Obrist, Jr. I'm coming as fast as I can. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! Ooh, don't know my own strength. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Okay, please welcome back to the Douglas Coleman Show, Bill Obrist Jr. Hey, Bill, how are you? Welcome back. Douglas, how are you? Thanks for having me again, man. I looked it up. It was just a little over three years ago that you were on the show. Uh, You were promoting a film called Hunting Grounds that you had done. And uh, John Porta, I can't remember his last name. I always want to say Portobello or something like that. (laughs) John John Portanova. Portanova. Uh, he would okay. appreciate. He he would like Portabella because he's a he's a, he's a weird fella. Was he a yeah, vegan? That was his. <laughs> Is he a vegan? Only eats mushrooms. Yeah. Probably so. Yeah. So, anyways, you were doing that film, and we talked about that. That was a Sasquatch film. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Sasquatch ripped off my arm. That's right. Yes. And now you've got a new film that you're promoting called Great Land. I watched yes. the trailer, and I don't know what to make of the trailer, because the the initial reaction I got was that it was sort of like Rocky Horror Picture Show with a more ominous message. That that I was. Think that's a, yeah. I think that's a. That's really good instinct on your part. Why don't you tell us a little about it? Because <laughs> I had to watch. I'll have to watch the trailer a few more times to pick up some more uh, details on it. But why don't you tell us about it? Well. It's. I remember asking Eric Roberts on set, Eric, what do you think this movie's about? And Eric said, I have no idea. Because it was a very strange script about a future world in which everyone was sort of obsessed with um, having fun. That was it. The whole world was fun, distractions and fun. But it's ruled by this very, very corrupt group of elite, wealthy Uh, very morally corrupt people. And there's a pandemic which occurs. And in the midst of this pandemic, there's a very bizarre election that's about to happen. And so that's the the, sort of the frame of this world. Well, when we shot this in early 18, of course, none of that meant anything. 
but now it it seems rather prescient and the trailer was cut to tie the world of the movie into our current world which seemed to sort of coincide that i haven't seen the final cut of the movie but the feeling i got from the trailer and from t- i just talked to dana the director before i did this because i want to be sure that i represent the movie well the trailer to me felt almost uh, like an assault on the senses a lot of bright colors and lights um very very quick moving yeah. burst of sound and uh, Donna Zia Shiva, the director, said that that is indeed what the movie will feel like. Is there an actual story or is it documentary ish? Yes. I mean, I couldn't figure out what to expect uh, if I, I think, was to sit and down I think and watch they that meant, movie. They meant it to be that mysterious. The, the story there's a young man named Ulysses, and he's gone to find his love, a young woman. And she has wandered over into the Forbidden Zone, which is where all of the uh, corrupt rulers of this world live. And I'm one of them. I am the philanthropist, one of the head people. And uh, I live on a place called Repentance Island. (laughs) (laughs) I I spent my time in the movie sitting in a bathtub full of blood uh, with floating cockroaches on lotus flowers in front of me. All right, yeah. It sounds just right up your alley, isn't it? Um, yeah. I've been in bathtubs of blood before, but I have never had cockroaches involved. And so it was nice. It was nice to work with cockroaches for a change. It's a notch on the bill. I, I assume they were rubber, not real, right? No, they were real. They were real? And they were, uh, oh. they were, movie, they were movie cockroaches. You know, they're a movie everything. You can get a movie worm if you want one people train them so they were trained to stay where they were put on the little lotus flowers but i was so worried they were going to jump off and drown in the blood well uh i can't believe anybody can train a cockroach is that something that people aspire to be a cockroach trainer to Douglas, me just... i don't know you can find anything <laughs> in los angeles you know that wow uh, that's a new one for me i have to write that down you know. I'll bet if you looked for trained mosquitoes, movie mosquitoes, you could probably find someone who says, yes, I've, I've trained these mosquitoes. So so the, the dialogue that I had was a sort of, a, I'm very corrupt, I'm a, I'm a pedophile, as everyone on this island is a pedophile. In fact, they have CGI'd in Jeffrey Epstein's famous mansion from Little St. James Island oh, up on the hill. Yeah. So he actually lives there, too. And uh, the dialogue that I'm spouting was this mixture of uh, Shakespeare and um, gibberish. The idea is that the rulers of this world are so educated and so elite that they almost have lost their intelligence. Um, In fact, it reminds me of the New Testament where uh, Paul is being examined and the king exclaims, Paul, your, your great learning has driven you mad. It's that sort of feeling. So... The experience of spouting that and staring at the cockroaches was very surreal. Well, there is a fine line between cuckoo and genius. And, uh, you know, I suppose we could get very political with this, and which I don't necessarily want to do right at this moment. But I did want to ask if there is a political message in this movie. I, th- I think there is. Um, it doesn't relate to our political world of our political parties, but I think there's a general message about the um, the great vast common people of the world versus those who deign to rule us and to rule over us and to consider themselves separated from us by um, by learning by virtue of superior intelligence and those sort of things it's it, I think it is sort of a cry of the common people type of movie uh, Donna, the director, she worked for the United Nations for years with UNESCO. And so she traveled all over the world and specialized in working with indigenous people and marginalized people. So I think there's some of that feel in it. Are you in L.A.? Yeah. How, how is it? Because every state was different with their, their, you know, strictness or severity of the lockdown. Quite severe. And it's different. I also have a beach home in South Carolina. I've been there during this time and it's completely different in how seriously people take it and the mask and social distancing and all this sort of thing so la is kind of coming out of the coming out of its coma i mean are the shops yes. opening up and things yeah that's right barber shops are now open and uh, so people can stop cutting their hair i know a lot of people <laughs> who just gave themselves buzz cuts because they figured what the hell i've always wanted to shave my head why not 
Well, it's a good time. Actually, you know what? I did that <laughs> because I figured, okay, you know, if I can't get a haircut for two months, it's no big deal. You know, it'll grow back to a, a normal length and then uh, maybe by then things will open. Yeah, the casinos are starting to open here. And, uh, and what's that like? What, what is it like there? Have you been in the casinos since they've opened? No, no, I have not. Hmm. I'm not a big gambler anyways, but... The one part of the casinos that has not opened yet are the buffets, which I'm actually kind of glad because that's a little too sharing at this point, mm -hmm. I think. And mm -hmm. so they've opened the, the restaurants and the cafes. But I've seen pictures of, like, they're putting up plastic partitions between the dealers and the players at, the, like, the blackjack tables and then yes. partitions between each player uh, you know, it, it reminds me of going to visit someone in prison is basically what it's like, where you've got partitions between everything. The only What about the theater shows there? Any of the shows open? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's kind of, that might be phase two. I haven't read the whole thing, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, but... Then once the the uh, the George Floyd situation happened, it it seems like everything kind of went out the window, uh, with social distancing and you know I don't know, it just seems so chaotic now. Theater is going to be tough. I tour had just started, in fact, touring. I got the approval of Ray Bradbury's family to portray Bradbury in a touring one man show on stage oh, called nice. Ray Bradbury Live Forever. And, of course, all my 2020 shows are, are off the books now. Um, but I haven't booked anything for 2021 even because it's a question of when will people be comfortable sitting shoulder to shoulder with strangers in a small space. I feel bad for a lot of performing artists at this point because they have really had to find some other means of support because everything just shut down. I mean, I I do a lot of interviews with musicians and most musicians these days that to make their money is on performing because yes. no, nobody wants to pay for music online anymore. And they've been doing like streaming from their living room and things like that, which is great. You know, I think that's wonderful, but it's not quite the same. There is a, there is a nice feeling about sitting there and actually seeing somebody playing and singing. Well, movie production is going to be different, too, for a little while. I have uh, three shoots scheduled for the fall, and they're all doing all sorts of gyrations to make sure that actors aren't very close to each other for most of the time. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but it's going to change the way shots are set up and scenes are structured. <laughs> How are you going to do a social distancing love scene? That should be interesting. I, that's... That will be the worst. And actually, in my business, you know, I tend to do play these dark, weird characters. My stock and trade is being too close to people for comfort. Like, my characters always want to get up really close. Uh, you know, I, I lick people's faces. I whisper in their ears. I grab their necks and all this sort of very, very close-in stuff. So, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I have to go back to work. But, uh, sure, I'm going to be concerned, too. I think at some point this thing, they're going to develop some sort of a vaccine. People are going to get tested. And I think once people have tested and, you know, I think we just have to get on with it. Yes. You get tested, you're negative. Okay, you're good to go. And, and little by little, we can put it back together. But I think there's always been risks long before this pandemic. You could have caught anything from anybody. Uh, yes, going out there. It's just it's been so hyped. Now I'm not suggesting that it's overhyped or it's fake. I'm not one of those tinfoil hat guys. But what I am saying is that this one was particularly hyped for whatever reason, and I, I think it's put it sort of put the fear, uh, fear of God, if you will, in people, and it's going to take some time to kind of uh, unfear people. I hope that we never go back to, quote, the way we were, quote, unquote, entirely, because it, it, it felt to me, especially in my business, like we were taking a lot of things for granted. We were taking a lot of what really matters in life for granted before. And I know that everybody I've talked to in my business during the lockdown has different versions of I learned during lockdown what was really important in life. 
everybody has some version of that story, and I hope that stays with us. Well, I think it gave people, right, it gave people time to reflect. It gave people time to spend more time with their family, mm -hmm. particularly people who had young children. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard some stories about people getting very creative on how to keep their three- and four-year-olds entertained all day long because mm -hmm. they weren't used to having them around. They'd be in preschool or kindergarten or something. And you can only put them on the computer or the iPad for so long, and then they've got to run out their energy. And where you can't really go out too much, uh, it was very challenging for some parents. So kudos to them. Indeed. So tell me a little bit about your background. Um, I don't know if we talked about that uh, the last time or not, but how did you get started in this business? I'm the stereotypical case of the, the weird misfit child who grows up to become an entertainer because the equation I learned when I was a weird misfit child was if you entertain people, they will not hit you. <laughs> True enough. They might throw things at you on stage. Well, yeah. I mean, and when every entertainer I've ever talked to who's worth their salt has some version of that story of people made fun of me when I was a kid. And the only way that I could fit in it was to be, be their little performing monkey. So in my case, I could change my voice. And um, so I would do imitations of teachers and principals. And they would, instead of shoving me against the locker, they would demand that I do these little routines for them. Um, so I was the little performing mascot, the court jester, and I would do my routines and they would not hit, hurt me anymore. And so that worked for me. And I just tried to parlay that my whole career has been one great effort to say, please don't hit me. <laughs> do you remember your first paid gig as an actor? Sure. Um, no one would hire me. I, I, I started out doing stage and no one would hire me. I couldn't get hired anywhere. So I just said, what the hell? I'll hire myself. So... Um, I looked around for something people were already doing that I knew worked. Mark Twain was working. A lot of guys put themselves through college playing Mark Twain, ripping off Hal Holbrook. I figured, why not me? So I went to the bank <laughs> with a business plan to buy a Mark Twain wig and costume. <laughs> really? And yeah. the bank gave me the two grand. I ordered it, and I started touring. And I remember when I got my first check, I vividly remember... And I thought, I'll be damned. You can just hire yourself. I didn't realize it. And I never, I never looked back. So when you went to the bank, what was your, what was your pitch? I want to hear. <laughs> well, I come from a business retail family, so I knew how to write a business plan. And I had it laid out on paper. You know, I had statistics, none of them relating to me. But, you know, <laughs> this show has attracted so many. You know, I just tried to overwhelm them with BS. And I think the loan officer really just felt sorry for me and figured, you know, it's only two grand. What the hell? Let him have it. Um, but yeah, and, and then afterwards, I remember the first time I was in an airplane shortly after that, flying to do a gig, and someone said, what do you do for a living? And with amazement, <laughs> with amazement, at the age of 23, I was able to say, I'm an actor. And I remember how good that felt, because it's all I ever wanted to be. And it's just, you know, whether you make a lot of money or not, it's a great thrill to be able to say, I do music, or, you know, I'm a writer, or I'm a painter, or I, whatever it is you really have always wanted to do to be able to say I do that. It's pretty cool. Well, it's pretty cool to be able to say it, and it's also pretty cool to be able to support yourself while doing it. Um, well, that's the trick. Yeah, that is the trick, because money seems to be feast or famine in this business. Always has been. And that's right. I think the Internet has helped people. I've... I'm finding more middle class people in the arts these days than I ever used to. Yes. And you know what I, I, I mean that's, by that. Yeah. That's very, yeah, I find that too. There's a lot of working actors. Yeah. Um, I started working in film 12 years ago, switched from theater to film mostly by embracing my face. If the camera sees me as malevolent, then that's what I'll specialize in and I'm um, finding a niche. And that's, that's the way I've done it. Have you ever done musicals? Never, no. I love to sing. I mean, I'm a, I'm a church choir singer, but uh, I, I have a specific type of face, and it's it's hard to get out of that niche for people to see me as anything other than malevolent. It's fine. I mean, I love to work, but no, I, I would never get cast for a musical. Well, unless they did a musical version of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. That's true. Yeah, you could probably I went out. Freddy, yeah. I, 
I, I, I would love to do something like that. Yeah. I wonder if that would be possible or it would be just totally ridiculous to do <laughs> a the singing fact that Freddy would Krueger. Be ridiculous. You, you know that the people who own the rights to that, Douglas, you know that conversation Spit had. Could we do Nightmare on Elm Street on ice? Why not? <laughs> I'm you, sure. You know there have been yeah. conceptual drawings. It's just for some reason it hasn't gone through yet. Maybe they couldn't stop laughing long enough to take it seriously. What, that hasn't stopped them from rebooting the damn films 20,000 times. That's true. I, how many parts to that are there? Like eight? I don't know. Yeah. But I'm like, stop, guys. I know you own the property, and I know you want to squeeze the last dime, but let it go. When, that, when, when Nightmare and all those other great horror films happened, they were original ideas. Have an original idea, for God's sake. Those were the days, though, back in the late 70s through the mm -hmm. 80s for those kind of hack em up slasher films. One thing that the coronavirus has brought to my house was time to watch all of these old movies that I haven't seen in years and years. Mm -hmm. And the one that I just watched recently was Sleepaway Camp. <laughs> I haven't seen that in years. How was your viewing of it? Oh, it was laughable. I mean, because uh -huh. the the film was just so bad. And, you know, at the end, I mean, I don't even know if you could make that film now because the character was a, a trans sort of person. And they didn't do it in a way that was very respectful to trans mm -hmm. people. So, you know, there's just a lot of things that you probably wouldn't do these days in that film. Um, that's right so i don't know but it was it was nice to sort of see the uh the great hair from from that time i always loved the way that people wore their hair in the late 70s and early 80s that's the great thing about film isn't it i mean you look at westerns from the late 60s and even though everything else is authentic from the hair you can always tell what era <laughs> yeah it's exactly. filmed in because the, the Westerns from the 1950s, they all had slick back, greasy hair. Sometimes they mess it up, you know, like uh, the one that always came to mind for me. And this wasn't my observation, it was my father. But you remember the show Happy Days, right? From the 70s. Of course. Yeah, sure. Okay. There were a couple of characters in that that had like shoulder length hair. Mm -hmm. And my father just kept going, nope, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong. I was there in the 50s, mm -hmm. nope, nope, no, no boys had hair that long. And he mm -hmm. got very upset. You know, he wouldn't watch the show anymore because he <laughs> said it just wasn't authentic, you know. Uh -huh. Even as uh, many awards that it won, he just was turned off by the fact that a couple of the characters had 70s haircuts. And it just was wrong for the 50s, so. Well, that that gets to, uh, and I know there's no time to discuss it, but I'll just mention it because I always find it interesting. Film and television, there's two views of it, and one is that it represents reality, and two is that it is its own reality. It doesn't have to have a direct connection to the reality that it purports to represent. It, it, it creates its own rules, and I always think it's more interesting when the second way like uh you know in my genre of film there's a problem with cell phones if it's set in modern days it's always you know well, why don't why does the kid just pick up the cell phone and say hey there's a creepy guy outside the window so they go through all these wild machinations of no cell phones this weekend or oh gosh i can't get a signal out here or, oh the cell phone broke but i'm always encouraging directors create your own world in which there are no cell phones or you can do anything you want it's, it's your own world and you can create your own rules but a lot of people aren't willing to do that. I've noticed that a lot of films that are more recently made are incorporating computer, internet, technology, phone into the film making itself much mm -hmm. more. I mean, is that, again, is that sort of like what you're talking about? That yeah, but it dates you. Like, you go back and look at War Games with Matthew Broderick. It's a great movie, but... You know, it's MS DOS. Yeah. So I, I used to people to concentrate on the universal aspects. If technology really plays a part in the movie, that's great. But otherwise, you know, what is what does it matter if in this world there are laptops, unless you need the laptop for the scene? Well, this kind of is a full circle conversation because it comes back 
to the thing we were talking about before we got on about music. And my mm -hmm. complaint about music is that when the computer creates the sound you're Oof. hearing more than a human being does, it loses its soul. Yes. And I could make that same argument about film, that mm -hmm. where you take away the, the actors performing and doing something and replace them with a screenshot of Facebook or uh, Twitter. Right. You know, it, it could take away the, the that passion. I mean, it's not going to be Casablanca well, if you're seeing well, Facebook. You, you know, Douglas, even when it comes to lighting a scene, um, the old guys, there's still a few, will actually light the scene as it is on the sets. But many of the younger guys, and it's just because the technology is available, they just want to get as much information as possible into the camera because the digital camera can take a ton of information. And then in post, they can do whatever they want. And they make all the changes in post. But there's, I think there's something that's lost from having a human hand say, I want this key light to cut across this actor's face diagonally and hanging the light and then having the actor during the performance find that light. That's, it's, it's a human interaction. And I think, it, I think you feel the loss of it when it's all done in computer. Well, it's funny because working with musicians, the same thing happens where I said, you know, I really like that sort of tape hiss sound in this one spot. It just it has a very warm kind of feeling. And the producer will say, oh, well, no problem. We can add that later. Uh -huh. You know, so digital actually removes the tape hiss sound by its <laughs> very nature. And then you can <laughs> add it back in later if you want which seems kind of a roundabout way where if you just use tape in the first place, <laughs> you will automatically right. get the tape is. I just, it's mind baffling. I, baffling. I, yeah. I started a podcast during the pandemic called Gothic Goodnight, where I do short fiction to put people to sleep, which my voice is well modulated to do. And, you know, read pieces from Dracula or Poe. But I wanted it to have the feel of some old radio dramas that I heard Vincent Price do. And so yeah. I, I work the mic really close and I leave the hiss in and, and I, I, I like it because there's just something organic about it. I, at first I thought, oh, I got to clean up all this hiss. But then I thought, no, I don't. We listened to radio for years and years. I used to be a DJ and I know Q-Burn well, <laughs> you know, at the beginning of all of the best songs, you always heard that. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was okay. And you'd hear the little hiss in the background. It's organic. It's all right. The crackling fire. It's, oh, uh, yeah. 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 Were you an Orson Welles fan? You were speaking about old radio. Absolutely. I had all of those old albums when I was a kid. My grandmother turned me on to old-time radio. So I, all of them, I, I memorized Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, the whole thing, when I was a kid. And that has lots of pop and crackle in it. Oh, God, yes. There's something where technology if you want to make a comparison, the technology then of just radio, but the whole story about where people actually believed that it was really happening, that it was actually a news broadcast, because they did it so well, they copied the format of a news broadcast, right? Yes. And they did it yes. so well that they convinced people that there were aliens landing in New Jersey. Pretty amazing. Well, I think this is a good spot to wrap it up right here. Uh, Bo, I did have one more question, though. Is there anything, any sort of character that you haven't played? Yeah, there is. Uh, there's one that I'd really like to do, and that's um, Eric in Phantom of the Opera, as he was originally written in the Gaston LaRue novel. Not the romantic and not the guy who had acid thrown in his face, but as originally written, that character was um, what we used to call a freak. He was so physically deformed that his parents sold him to a traveling sideshow. And that that was the root of why he became what he became. I wouldn't even care if there's an opera in it. Just that character, the wounded monster, the, the monster who is a monster because society has viewed him as such until he became that. I love, love, love that character. And, uh, and and we don't get that kind of character much. That's the gold standard for me is the, the wounded monster. What would you have him doing? 
I don't know. And I've talked to a couple of directors about this. It's public domain. You could put him anywhere. You know, you could keep the same contours of the story, but it certainly doesn't have to be an opera. But the interesting parts of that story have always been cut out of the film version, which is his early life um, in what was then called Persia and how he learned all of his magic tricks because he worked for a shah and if he didn't perform the magic he himself would have been killed and then that elevated to him killing people in creative ways for the shah's amusement so he learned to be a murderer and all of these things that formed what we finally see that the lon cheney version in 1925 the silent version originally had this stuff in it and it ended with the phantom dying at his organ of a broken heart and the audience hated it because the character was too sympathetic the audiences in 1925 would not accept it so they went back and changed it and made him sort of a you know monstrous character mm-hmm. which i think is a shame my guest is bill obris jr his new movie out is called great land is it out now no it'll be out later this year and um, i would encourage people to google for the trailer just the word great land one word and have a little assault on your senses. (laughs) Bill, thanks so much for coming on again. Always love talking to you. Uh, I hope this film does well. And uh, are you working on anything else at the moment? Yeah, I've got a movie coming out also at the end of the year called Pain Killer. It's about uh, a father whose daughter died of opioid abuse, and he's in a vengeful mood. And so that means there will be blood. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you again for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Douglas. I enjoyed it. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Hi there. This is Stuart Epps, record producer. This is my story about Elton John uh, working with him in those early years, going back to 1967 at Dick James. Uh, all the amazing tours, those first recordings, uh, going through to Rocket Records. And uh, it's an amazing story about his incredible rise to stardom and my part in that. So uh, look forward to taking you on that journey. So here we go. Yeah, and to order this great audio CD, please just email me at stuartepps at talk21.com. That's Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Epps, E-P-P-S, at talk, T A L K. 21 in figures.com. Stuart Epps at talk21.com. Email me and I'll give you all the details for buying this brilliant audio disc. Thank you. Bye. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments, or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Acclaimed author of Garden, Jane Yates brings you the first book in a new trilogy, Octopus Pirate, a story of a foundling who has unusual talents, such as the ability to communicate with octopuses. As a baby, he was washed up on an island off the Scottish mainland. An eccentric former nun who lives alone with cats brings him up. He joins a circus and narrowly escapes plots against him. Flees to Cornwall, builds a replica pirate ship that's also an airship to travel back in time to fight real pirates. Get your copy today from Amazon, only 99 cents. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro-Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians, and everyone else, to commit to truth-oriented behaviors. The Pledge asks signees to commit to 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows lead to truthfulness, such as clarifying one's opinions and the facts, 
citing one's sources, and celebrating people who update their beliefs toward the truth. Private citizens who sign the pledge get the benefit of contributing to a more truth-oriented society. Public figures get more substantive rewards for signing the pledge in the form of positive media and public recognition. The pledge crowdsources the truth by asking volunteers to evaluate the statements of public figures who sign the pledge. Take the pledge, demand that your elected representatives do so, and encourage your friends to take it at ProTruthPledge.org. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, Frederick Keeve. Hi, Frederick, how are you? Hi, Douglas. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, my film, The Compass, came out uh, yesterday. It was kind of a, you know, obviously a big day for the nation with Blackout Tuesday, but now we're kind of... Uh, back today you know promoting it on itunes and amazon and fandango now google play and voodoo you know all the platforms so yeah exciting times well that's great i did watch the film and uh i really liked it the music was fantastic and that was the first thing that struck me about the film was the music and i assume you wrote all of that score for the film correct Right. And uh, firstly, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to watch it because, you know, 93 minutes, it's a feature. 93 minutes is a good chunk of time to commit to. So thank you so much for that. And yeah, the, the, the movie really all originated from the music because I have been playing piano since I've been four and, you know, been schooled in piano and music theory. And I have a degree from I have several degrees, but my first undergraduate degree was from uh, UCLA in music. And so that music has been just a part of my life forever. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that. You've presumpted, <laughs> me. You've presumpted me just a little bit because that was going to be my next question. And the question was, because the music was so powerful and so up in the mix, as it were, I was going to ask you if you wrote the film for the music or you wrote the music for the film so you've already answered that question and i kind of suspected that the film well, came from the music um yeah no it's actually uh i i didn't really answer it completely and, and you know you're uh you're really uh very insightful to say that and you've asked it in a different way than any other interviewer that i've talked with so that's a that's a great question and it um you know, it's interesting because the tagline for the film, and you know how hard, you know, everything looks like it's easy. Oh, they just made this film and, it, and here it is. Everything is hard. You know, it takes a lot of work, whether it's writing a screenplay or actually, you know, in production or in post. And, you know, a, just a tagline that take, or a title, you know, it takes a lot of thought because you want to come up with something. It's like if you hear uh, Jaws or Star Wars, that immediately tells you what the film is about. You know, those are brilliant right. titles. So the film really is about myself, you know, the accompanist uh, at a ballet studio at, at the wonderful Westside Ballet School of Ballet in Santa Monica, where I, I actually do work part time. But the tagline, um, you know, it took some work. It took a few days and it went through a lot of, you know, you go through a lot of horrible ideas and Finally, we came up with uh, when there's nowhere left to hide, the music will find you. So it, it does it does all circle around the music. And, um, and, and that's really how I came up with the idea for the film. I was literally sitting at the piano at Westside School of Ballet, the, the same wonderful uh, training ground for, you know, that what my, um, I have four children, but uh, two of my daughters, when they were, you know, like say from five to 15, uh, took, took ballet classes there. And then now, you know, years later, here I am part time, you know, working as a ballet accompanist. So I was sitting at the piano one day waiting for the next class to start. And I thought, well, I'm, what am I going to do for my next film? I'd like to do 
something with music, you know, because uh, music is so much a part of my life. And then um, I love ballet. I think it's a gorgeous art form, and I and I know a little bit about it. And I want to do a gay love story because um, I've never done anything like that. And, it, you know, as an artist, I like to push myself and kind of go to the edge of, you know, artistically what I think is challenging or that I'm afraid to do. And so uh, those kind of things just kind of popped up in my mind and I started writing. If you don't mind, I want to just tell you a quick story. Um, when I was 18 years old, I was living in New York at the time and I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Art and I was studying acting. The ballet scenes in that film, because there were so many of them, I just started to laugh because I was absolutely the worst dancer in the class. Everything else I was great at, but the dancing I just could not get. And I, I got so comical with it that the teacher finally put me on the piano to accompany the dancers because I could play piano. <laughs> Because I was just so horrible at, at, at the ballet. I mean, you remember the episode of I Love Lucy when she goes to take ballet lessons? I mean, it was really like that, you know. Mm. And although the whole class laughed when I got up there, the teacher finally said, okay, forget it. You're going to sit at the piano and play, and that'll be your grade for the, for the class. And so <laughs> I hadn't thought of that in a long time, so I just thought I would throw that in. Go I ahead. appreciate the share, and I'm I'm kind of in the same boat. I mean, I I actually did start to take ballet classes again about a year ago, and uh, you know, I'm just I won't say I'm terrible, but I'm I'm not. That's not my forte. But as a pianist, it's really nice to be able to experience the dance, uh, the class as a dancer, even if it's you know a beginning class. So, yeah. But I mean, you have so many other talents, uh, Douglas. So you know. We'll, I'm sure you're focusing on those, all your other skills. That you're <laughs> yeah, I quickly gave up any aspirations to be the next Nureyev. I mean, I just, there was not a chance in hell <laughs> that that was going to happen. Um, speaking of Nureyev, and since we're on the subject of ballet, and I've always wondered this, why is it that the Russians have produced the greatest male ballet dancers for the last hundred years? I don't understand it. I mean, well, you've got Nijinsky, you've well, got Nureyev, Baryshnikov, uh, Vladimir, uh, what's his name? Vasilyev. And... That sounds right. You know, and it's like, what did they do? I mean, here it was a communist country for a <laughs> for hundred years. And the best thing that they produced were these incredible male ballet dancers. So I don't understand it. Why, why is that? Well, it's a big question, and, and how I would frame it is, um, first of all, I've um, not too long ago, I actually went to see the, um, I don't know, it was the Kirov or the, the Bolshevik. It, it was some ballet dancers that were doing a special benefit. And I actually, I was very lucky because I, I was a guest and I got to sit in on their class, so I got to see how they train. And you just, like, when you see them do the bar, uh, you, they point like no other American ballet dancer does, really. I mean, not to, you know, say that we're not good, but they have a system of training that is probably, you know, it's very, it's unparalleled. And, and, the, and the dancers start very young, and it's very systematic. But I think the Russians had it all. They had it in literature. Uh, you know, if you go back to like the end of the 1800s or yes. you know before the revolution, like right. the 1800s, they had it in not just in dance, but in music and in literature yeah. and in yeah. everything. The Russians had this massive renaissance, and it's in it's impacted us here in the United States, especially in acting. I mean, Stanislavski is is the touchstone. You know, you always yeah. go back to what Stanislavski taught in my first film my first feature film was a documentary about the great michael chekhov who was stanislavski's most prized pupil and was supposed to carry on the tradition but he ended up in hollywood and that film from russia to hollywood is about michael chekhov's journey and uh he used to sit in his uncle anton's study and when he was a little kid and watch him while he wrote at his desk 
but he ended up in Hollywood coaching Marilyn Monroe and James Dean and all these great stars. So I'm telling you, the Russians, they got it. They have it in the arts. They had it, and it all came to us. So they're great at whatever they do. Well, it's very true. And even um, the Cirque du Soleil movie, Worlds mm -hmm. Away, uh, the lead guy in that, his name is uh, Igor, I think it's uh, Zaripov. He's an amazing dancer. And that is sort of ballet. It's ballet on a on a wire flying around in the sky. But his moves are all very ballet, definitely. And I love that film. I think that's a great film. Well, I'm going to check it out. And also I wanted to say I loved your, because uh, I like researching my hosts and uh, and my interviewers, and I and I, I listened to your wonderful podcast with jo Joseph Culp, and I'm old enough to remember and be a big fan of Robert Culp. Of his so father, yeah. That was, and yeah. you know, so welcome to the men's group. That was, that was a great um, podcast. I enjoyed that. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. He was a great guest, and I don't know if you've seen the film, but it's definitely worth watching. Uh, it is a great film. Yeah, I did. I went, once I heard the podcast, I went and watched the film, and it's it's um I really enjoyed it. It's not a film I would make, but um you know, he was so passionate about what he did and he had all those wonderful actors. Yeah. So that was amazing. Yeah. Um I wanted to touch on something you said and forgive me if this question is too personal, but did you you said you were not gay? Um well, so the the I'll try to give you a short version of that. <laughs> I was married for 20 years okay. to a woman. Uh, someone that I had met at UCLA, fell in love, got married, started having all these kids. And uh, I guess we just didn't understand birth control or what. But anyway, we had, you know, we had uh, three kids right away. And then um, my daughter, who actually um, just graduated from film school, her name's Lily, and she, she lives across from me here in a bungalow in, in Venice, where I, where I live. And, uh, and so... We, you know, we had a, a nice life, you know, raising our kids, and it was a lot of fun. And then um, she decided to leave me um, after 20, 21 years of marriage, and just she wanted to be on her own. So uh, after she left, uh, you know, divorce is never easy. It was a, it was a painful process, but after I kind of healed from it after a couple of years, I just... I, when I started dating, I just sort of fell into dating guys, but it wasn't planned. It just, you know, was kind of like this, okay, well, this feels good. This feels like the right thing to do. And so that's kind of, it sort of uh, happened naturally. And okay. so now I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't have a partner right now or anything, but um, yeah, it just, uh, so, uh, well, to answer the question, then, uh, some of the things in the film are definitely inspired from my own life. You know, I tried to take some of those things and mix it up with a lot of drama. Well, that was that was the yeah. reason I asked the question it was not just to be nosy, but to because you had said earlier on that it was a challenge for you to play that character. And then you mentioned having a wife and four children. So the character in the film really is you. And then he, he meets the, the young ballet dancer and falls in love. The question I was going to ask was, was it difficult to play a gay character? But I guess not particularly. <laughs> if that's, I, I'm getting well, tongue-tied here because I, I'm trying to phrase this in a way that... Uh, let, me, let me back up. People in Hollywood have some people in Hollywood have criticized straight males for playing gay characters. There was an, an issue with, I think it was Scarlett Johansson, who was going to play a, a transsexual or a transgender, and she got slammed by the LGBTQ community, and she backed out of the film. So I'm just wondering, there was no issue with that for you, right? Well, and, and again, um, just a wonderful question and very thoughtful because um, I think, you know, as, as actors, we, I mean, do I have to be a killer to portray a killer? I mean, well, right. do how many, um, you know, uh, gay actors, <laughs> and there's many of them out there that play straight males. I mean, you know, it's, it's like we just, 
Um, I mean, certainly nowadays, you know, like when Natalie Wood played uh, Maria in West Side Story, I mean, it's, I, I think it's a classic and she did a wonderful job. That wouldn't play today because, you know, with the new West Side Story, they want people who are really of that ethnicity or be more respectful of that. And so things have changed a little bit. For me, the challenge was, yes, obviously I've had those experiences, you know, after my divorce. So that uh, maybe was helpful um, in playing the character. But what was the character, what was challenging for me is that even though there's so much of me in the character, I'm not that character. So I, I realized that early on that Jason Holden is not Frederick Keith, but I bring a lot of Frederick Keith to that character, but he is different from me in in many ways, and and then there's similarities. So I, I don't know if that answers the question, but... Well, actually, it inspired another question. How are you different from Jason? Um, that is a great question. Um... Uh, well, I would have to think about that one. <laughs> you want to get um, back to me on it? <laughs> I think, no, I would say, like, I'm just going to say what comes to mind. Um, I think I have a better sense of humor than he does. <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. I mean, that's just one thing that just occurs to me. Because, like, when I talk about stories of Hollywood, even if it's about someone who, like my mentor, uh, Gregory Peck, who I just, you know, adored and who was such an amazing person, um, you know, I, I like to go to the funny stories, you know, like the things that I remember about people, even if they're big stars or about myself, you know, because I think a lot of life is really, it just, I think there's a bigger purpose to it. You know, I have my own spiritual journey, but it also seems kind of random and sort of absurd. Like the things that you, you think will happen, never happen. And the things you think would never happen in a million years do happen. I mean, how could me, for example, um, you know, wanting to make my way up uh, as a feature film director, uh, you know, start with a with a short, which was what this was originally. I had a feature script, but we started with a short because that was all we could afford to do. And then just it became, as we went along, it became a feature film. When does that happen? And, and when do I, when does it happen that someone like me, an independent filmmaker, gets you know, was fortunate enough to have all these incredible people to support this film. The companies our wonderful distributor, Dark Star Pictures, and our sales agents, uh, Motion Picture Ex Exchange, and our wonderful PR people, October Coast. All these people who are so excited and so supportive. It, that doesn't happen very often. You know, I, I just feel like it's a great gift. So, I don't know. That's the first thing that comes to mind is that, um, you know, I... I, I think I have a better sense of humor than my character. Yeah, he didn't seem to have much of one at all, Jason. I exactly. I'm a little. I'm a little more. I mean, my personality. Uh, I'm a little uh, lighter. Although he was go going through some heavy stuff, but um, I'm a little um, goofier. You know, goofy. I can be goofy. Yeah, you know, I'm, just, I'm an artist. I mean, you know, I work hard, but I can be. So that's that's one difference that I never even really thought about till now. Yeah, he was real tight. He was real uh, almost morose in, in a certain way. And what was the character's name, the dancer's character? What was his name? Uh, Br Brandon Wykowski's lover? Brandon, or, yeah. Uh, uh, right, the, the dancer he fell in love with. Yeah. Brandon, yeah. I mean, he was very uh, quick Ricky, to point... Ricky played the actor's name is uh, Ricky Palomino, right? Ricky Palomino, yeah, wonderfully so talented. Yeah, no, but in the movie, the character that that Ricky plays was very quick to point out to Jason in and several. I can't remember the exact lines, but it was kind of oh, there was one. Okay, when you played the song that you wrote for him at the piano, and then it's right. sort of. Uh, disintegrated into an argument and he said something to the effect of at least I'm not afraid to tell you I love you that was a good line that was yeah, the one I do and, remember and, and that and that was a big issue because uh, you know uh, Ricky uh, Ricky's character Brandon was um, he was kind of a bad boy you know it's a fun character to play he was kind of naughty but 
But yet he was all heart. He was right there. And I think my character was very, um, in some ways, very closed. He was, yeah. he was struggling so much. So, um, you know, he couldn't be as honest as he wants to be. And that's another difference with the two characters, because I'm pretty honest. Like, I'll, I'll just put myself out there in a, in a nice, gentle way, but I'll still, I'll, I try to be authentic and honest. And it, not that Jason wasn't trying to be authentic, but I think he was just kind of wrapped up in himself and his situation. Uh, very much. Well, we do have to wrap it up. And on that little pause, I think that's a good place. My guest is Frederick Keeve. Your film is called The Accompanist. You said it premiered yesterday or today? It, it actually opened, uh, yeah, it was released yesterday on, um, you know, all the platforms, Amazon, iTunes, uh, Google Play and some others. So yeah, and if anyone wants to check it out, uh, we have a wonderful Instagram, which is at the accompanist uh, movie, at the accompanist movie. So you can check it out or you can contact me uh, at, on my Instagram, which is F as in Fred, F Keeve, F K E E V E, if you want to reach out to me, if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, so I hope people will uh, be intrigued enough uh, to go out and check out the film. Super. Frederick, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was great fun talking to you. Uh, best of luck with the film. Again, I, I liked it. I love the music. The music was just incredibly powerful. And uh, uh, I hope the film well, does well. Well, I, I will leave. I, I, sorry, I was just going to say, Douglas, I'll leave you with this note. I'm going back in the recording studio next week. I'm doing uh, a soundtrack for the accompanist movie. So I'm really excited. I'm going to add a couple more bonus tracks and release that. So people who love the music, um, you know, can, can get the, uh, the soundtrack. Oh, well, I think I'll get that. Definitely. I, I think <laughs> okay. Well, great. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Douglas, for having me on. Your